The Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International presents this luncheon lecture. Today's topic, what really causes cancer and what you can do to prevent it. Your presenter, Ron Hunting Hockey, MD. All right. Thank you. I'm glad the sun came out. Okay, let's just get right into this. I'm, I'm curious for those of you that are willing to raise your hand to answer my question. How many of you in this room have been told by a doctor that you have cancer? That you're willing to share that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into the diagnosis of cancer. You know, the, those first questionings, you know, do I have it? The physical examination, the lab tests, the x-rays, the scans, the tumor markers, the biopsies, all of that. And then to get that information, it's quite a life-changing event. Now, here's my second question. Did any of you that were given that information, for, oh, let's just have you raise your hands, did, did any of the doctors that you saw offer to explain to you what really caused your cancer? Doesn't happen too much, and, and I'm not going to go into the whys of that. That's a whole other lecture in and of itself. But today I want to do that. I want to be a physician that for those of you that have had that to face, or for the many of you that have, that have uh, close family, fam, family members or friends that have been given this diagnosis, I think it's important for you to understand the biology of cancer. What are the underlying mechanisms? that bring about cancer. Because if you know that, that's going to give you some important clues on what you need to do to take better care of yourself. Uh, we have with us today Dr. Glenn Highland. Glenn, could you just stand up? Glenn's going to be up here with me uh, after the lecture. Glenn is a radiation oncologist, Mayo trained, and he's going to come up after the presentation to help answer questions. Glenn has been working here now for almost a year uh, part-time and uh, he will help me with the the medical question the medical oncology questions that you might have but today what our big focus is is the biological questions what is it about this cancer thing I mean how many of you have the same feeling that I have that it seems like you, you wake up every day and someone else has got cancer it's just uh, it seems to be more and more common and maybe we're just more aware of it because of the media but nevertheless, it's a very unsettling feeling that people have because it, of course, evokes a lot of fear. And I'm going to propose to you that a lot of the fear is because no one ever talks about why people get cancer. There's a lot of maybe theoretical ideas. People talk about miracle treatments. But what I want to do is get down to just the nuts and bolts of the biology of cancer. My calling here at the center uh, for the past 20 years, I just had my 20 year anniversary of being here last Friday, is to try to take complex subjects, this is a complex subject, and make it understandable by just the general public, you. Those of you who, who uh, either you have cancer, you have friends and family that has cancer, or you want to prevent cancer in yourself, these are important things that I think that you should know about. We have a beautiful setting here, this, the, the Bright Spot for Health, the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning. This has been our purpose. I believe that we fill an important gap in, in medical uh, care today, that is part of the educational gap, helping people to become good co-learners based upon good scientific information. That will help you in your quest to either survive or to prevent cancer. Now the concepts that I'm going to be talking about today, I'll be repeating myself fairly commonly and so unfortunately that's what you need to do to get some of these basic ideas across. First of all, we need to understand that cancer is a biological event. Sometimes it seems like it's a demon or some kind of thing that, that we, uh, we get attacked with, uh, but in reality it grows out of our biology. And what I'm going to be talking about is health and healing because I believe you can heal cancer. Now the elusive cure for cancer is still out there. No one has determined the cure for cancer. 
Uh, but a lot of it has to do with better quality living, better life choices. And the reason for that will become obvious as I get into my presentation. But we all start out relatively healthy, but life causes injury. We can expect to be a part of the school of hard knocks. Uh, when there's an injury to our system, if we hit our finger with the hammer accidentally, a signal goes out to our to our system that's painful and and a healing process begins repair occurs and the the the, the swollen finger eventually does heal and and it's interesting that we we all have the belief if we cut ourselves or hit our finger that's going to heal unfortunately when we're given the diagnosis of cancer there's too many of us that feel like that's a death sentence that we don't have the capacity to really overcome this dreaded disease. Many people feel that, not everyone. And, I, and if I can do anything today, it's to impart to you that with proper care, the best of conventional medicine and the best of good biological uh, nutritional medicine, you can go a long ways towards healing, better than I think most people realize. Where we want to focus at now is at the cellular level because cancer is not something that you see, unless it's, of course, a skin cancer it tends to happen on the inside and so we know that something is happening to our cells that's what doctors do is they get biopsies to look at the cells to see what's gone wrong so we have to understand cancer at the cellular level so I'm going to introduce some terms that probably some of you have never heard of but I'm going to define my terms in the course of the lecture at the cellular level health is balanced redox Redox. We'll get to that in just a minute. When there's an injury at the cellular level, it disrupts this balance, of course. And what causes a signal to be sent out that there's been damage and that the immune system, the inflammation system needs to get involved is oxidation. Oxidations. And we'll, we'll go into that in quite a bit of detail. The re repair process is nothing other than inflammation, but inflammation does occur at the cellular level and there's some specific things that happen and there are things that can go wrong that actually set up the process of cancer. And if everything goes right, if your body has the healing resources that it needs, that injury at the cellular level can be restored to normal functioning. It's really important that you believe that. You have to see that, that the body wants to heal. Now to help in this process, I've taken uh, 12 insights and given them to you as a handout and I'm going to weave these insights through the presentation so that when we're all done and you're thinking to yourself, now what exactly did he say? You can go back and read these one at a time and get a sense for the sequence of events that occurs at the cellular level that causes cancer. So uh, I did have this in three paragraph forms and it was a little bit much for people to, to bite off. And I realized, I gave this talk, by the way, up in Toronto at, at the Cancer Continuum meeting up there. And so uh, this is going to help you come away with a better understanding. So what is the cause of most cancers? The, insight, the first insight is that the cause of most cancers can be traced back to sustained cellular injury. I can't emphasize that word enough, sustained cellular injury due to cumulative physical, chemical, biological, and or emotional damage. So let's look at these different damaging effects within the cellular level. How about chronic physical damage? Radiation obviously can be quite damaging. If, you're, if you were at Hir Hiroshima, you got badly irradiated and if you didn't die in the bomb blast, you, you died from the effects of uh, radiation sickness. Uh, electromagnetic fields, trauma, irritants. These are physical things that happen to us that can set the stage for sustained cellular in injury. How about the chemical damage? Now this is what probably we're most familiar with, carcinogens, toxic chemicals, heavy metals, pesticides. This is what a lot of people worry about. And yet we do know that these are factors in the development of cancer and, and the common denominator is if we're chronically exposed to these things they're injuring our cells in a sustained way. Biological damage, aging, you know the, the number one risk factor for getting cancer is your age. As you get older the risk factors go up partly because of 
sustained damage to cells, free radicals, chronic infections such as viruses, chronic inflammation, insufficient growth and repair molecules, and stem cell depletion. This is a whole new area that we'll just touch on today. Finally, the chronic emotional or the mind-body damage. We've all heard of people who have had a serious trauma. Someone's left them or they've lost their job or they've had some kind of abusive situation for a long time and this huge stress soon thereafter they'll develop cancer. So stress, depression, loss of meaning, loss of purpose, loss of human connectedness. This can be, can kind of set the stage. It's, it's, a, it's not as tangible as the physical, chemical, and biological, but it's a real cause that sets us up for cancer. It's clear there are some good research, for example, that depression and cancer are definitely related. So the cause of cancer is sustained cellular injury that's causing an imbalance in the redox system, which I'm yet to define. That then is causing persistent disruption of the normal affairs of the cellular life. The net result is excessive oxidation. I'm going to come back to this over and over again. Excessive oxidation is a, is a signal that causes inflammation to persist in an inappropriately long way. It, it, it goes on and on and it causes damage to our cells. This causes the cells in their attempt to survive to actually regress. And what I mean by regression is that as a human body, we are a community of cells. We have organs, but within those organs there are all kinds of different cells. And these cells have to live together in harmony. It's part of being a multicellular organism. But before we were multicellular, we, we to some degree came from single cells. And those single cells will try to survive in their own right. But if, we're, if these multicellular control mechanisms are damaged enough, will start to regress back and the cells will start to function as single cell renegades. So let's look at the second key insight in terms of what really causes cancer. Free radical damage, chronic cellular injury and persistent inflammation create a zone of intense free radical damage and oxidative stress. Now, these words may be foreign to some of you, but as we go through the lecture, you'll start to get a better idea of what I mean by oxidative stress. Oxidants cause damage to our cells. And the way they do that from a, from a chemical point of view is they steal electrons. Oxidants uh, are, are uh, bandits. And they are the free radicals. A free radical and an oxidant is the same thing. And I'm sure many of you have heard about how the free radical theory of degenerative disease and cancer. So let's talk a little bit about the chemistry of this, just to kind of keep this in real simple terms. When you have an oxygen with, which only has one electron in its outermost orbit, uh, that, that little electron, that's, that's an oxidant. It has an unpaired electron. And here's a donor molecule, and it's got an electron here to donate. And what ends up happening is the oxidant steals the electron and, and now it's no longer an oxidant. It's been neutralized. It's been actually reduced is the, is the chemical term for this. So the, ox, the oxygen gained a, pair, <coughs> a paired electron and was reduced in chemical terms. So antioxidants are nothing other than electron donors. So that instead of the D, I've got an AO standing for antioxidant. And this one happens to have two electrons that it's willing to donate. And here's your free radical with the unpaired electron. And when, when, the, uh, when the redox reaction occurs, the, the electrons are donated and the free radical is neutralized. It's reduced. Notice how the free radical gained an electron and was reduced. So I'm giving you a pretty complicated chemical concept, but it's really not that hard to understand. Reduction is the gain of an electron, and oxidation is the loss of an electron. Just, of course, the opposite of what you'd think it would be, but that's science for you. So redox, I'm, de I'm defining my term now because remember I said that cellular health is balanced redox. That's where the transfer of electrons from an antioxidant, the reducing agent, to an oxidant the oxidizing agent, that's balanced. And doesn't that make sense? Inside the life of the cell, if it's going to be healthy, 
it's going to have to balance the effects of these free radicals. And so you're going to have to have adequate amounts of antioxidants to create this balance. And we do know that antioxidants prevent oxidant damage. How do we know that? Let's use a very common everyday example from the kitchen. If you slice an apple and you leave it out to the oxygen, the air, the oxygen, what's going to happen to that apple? It's going to turn brown. But what if you take that same apple and you you slice it, expose it to the air, but now you squeeze some lemon juice on it, it's going to stay fresh. So the lemon juice provides electrons. It's an antioxidant to keep the apple fresh. And so this is putting it in, uh, in kind of graphic terms. Here was the oxygen. The lemon reduced the oxygen, made it less toxic. And so that prevented the sliced apple from becoming the browned apple. It didn't happen thanks to the lemon. This is why we all know this. What do you do to prevent cancer? Eat fruits and vegetables. They are rich in colorful antioxidants. Lemons, oranges, apples, berries, anything that's got a lot of color has a, a, a lot of antioxidant power. And so it's now scientifically accepted that you can prevent cellular damage by eating adequate amounts of fruits and vegetables. It used to be the American Cancer Society said that diet didn't have anything to do with cancer. It's kind of amazing that that was the, the position that they held. But now their posters have lots of colorful fruits and vegetables because we know, and, and it's been repeated over and over again, you know, do your five colors per day. I would say nine or ten, but, but at least get five a day as a way of keeping your balance between oxidation and reduction. Keep your redox balance uh, where it should be. Okay, let's move on here now. We're, 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 we're moving along in this discussion of what really causes cancer. So oxidative stress, this is where, the balance, where it's imbalanced now, where you've got too much oxidation and not enough antioxidants to balance the equation. Free radicals cause oxidative stress. And that signals the release of special molecules called cytokines. Okay, now I've introduced a new word, cytokines. Cyto means cell, kinetics means action. So cytokines are these, these little peptides these, that are released in the vicinity of cells that bring about action steps that helps the cells adjust to environmental challenges. When you, when you accidentally hit your finger, it's due to cytokines that the, the junctions in your, in your blood vessels, they become looser. So the fluid leaks out and that's why your finger swells up. But the reason for that is so that the white blood cells can get out and, and clean up any germs and repair the injury. So there's a very real reason why cytokines appear. So if you have this cellular inj injury, the wound, that's going to create some oxidative stress which we now know is a biological signal. It tells the, the body that there's some damage and actually the stress, the oxidation can cause damage so there can be a little loop here but this oxidation actually signals the formation of cytokines which then brings on inflammation. And once again you have to remember, you know, a lot of people think of inflammation in a bad way and, and granted there is bad inflammation. If you've got severe arthritis and you're joints are deteriorating due to chronic inflammation. That's bad inflammation. But the purpose of inflammation was to protect us from injury or from the effects of injury to neutralize any germs or bacteria that might have gotten in there and created uh, an, a, a huge infection and, and caused uh, death. So, so, But this is an example of where maybe if the damage persists and the oxidative stress grows, that causes more and more cell signaling, which causes inflammation. And if the inflammation doesn't resolve the problem, the inflammation itself can cause damage, which then causes more signaling. Are you beginning to see how cancer is a healing mechanism gone awry? It hasn't been able to complete its job. And so what happens is it starts to amplify and amplify, and then some bad things start to happen. Now, we know that this cytokine signaling is very important. We're doing what I consider groundbreaking research here at the center on this very notion of cytokine signaling. 
And one of the things that we're, we have underway now, one of our studies, is to take cancer patients and look at their cytokines. There's not just one cytokine, there's hundreds. And we have a cytokine array that measures 174 cytokines that can serve as a kind of fingerprint as to what's going on at the cellular level. Is the body triggering maybe apoptosis, I'll define that later, inflammation, angiogenesis, atherosclerosis, you know, the coordination of injury repair is all taking place because of cytokines. But what happens if those cytokines are out of balance? This is uh, one of the findings that we've had in our, in our research looking at cancer patients is that they're way out of balance. They've got 69 active inflammatory cytokines, but only seven anti-inflammatory cytokines. Their angiogenesis, the creation of new blood vessels, is going crazy, and the anti-angiogenesis is very light. And so cancer is where the cytokine signal has tipped way out of balance. There's excessive cytokine signaling going on, which is triggering more inflammation than what the body can deal with, which is in turn causing more oxidative stress, and it starts to become a whole vicious cycle. And you can see here uh, oncogene activation way outweighs oncogene deactivation. Oncogene are the genes that may uh, regulate cancer formation. I'll come back to that slide just a little bit later. So what we see happening is cytokine signal intensifies. And if you don't have the nutrient reserves, if they're depleted or inadequate and the damage cannot be repaired, then this cytokine signaling is going to intensify the inflammatory response even further in a desperate attempt to address the mounting oxidative stress. So really at the core, the core cause of cancer is really oxidative stress that's out of control, that your body doesn't have the resources it needs to, to, to quell it, and it continues to just grow. <clears throat> so this kind of gives you an idea of you know, once again, we're, we're trying to look at health and healing. What is cellular health? Health is the, is the nutritional microenvironment of our body cells, and it's crucially important to our health. And deficiencies in that environment can constitute a major causes of, of disease, such as cancer. And this is Dr. Roger Williams, who wrote a beautiful book called Nutrition Against Disease. And really the center, I can almost say he was the founding concept father of, of what we do out here using nutrition to help people beat chronic illnesses such as cancer. So the individualized nutritional environment resists uncontrolled multiplication of damaged cells. If you've got adequate nutrients, then this cytokine signaling is not going to get out of control because the, 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 the nutrients are going to help you heal the damage. Control mechanisms that maintain cellular differentiation require maintenance and repair nutrients. Once again, if you're not eating very well, if you're nutri nutritionally depleted, that's going to set you up for uh, the inability to fix the damaged control mechanisms that regulate the inflammatory process. And individualized nutrients can be found to overcome hereditary weaknesses. Some people have very deep deficiencies in, let's say, folic acid. Folic acid is a big cancer preventer because it helps you repair DNA. And if you if you have a, a genetic inability to utilize uh, folic acid, and there, there are fairly, a fairly large number of people that do, that can set you up for being at risk for losing this cellular control, which we're going to talk about right now. Is everyone following me so far? Hang in there, hang in there. It gets, it, it gets more interesting. DNA damage occurs. Although healthy cells depend upon oxidation, here I've kind of been bad-mouthing oxidation like it's the worst thing ever, Healthy cells depend upon oxidation for normal metabolism and immune defense. But if you've got sustained oxidative stress, oxidation out of balance, that will damage the DNA in the cell's nucleus in the mitochondria. That's where you make energy. And of course, the nucleus is where you can, that's where the control mechanisms of the, of the, of the cell reside. <clears throat> now, all of you have dealt with people that have cancer. And cancer is a very complex phenomenon. It's not just 
the tumor itself, it's the effects upon, uh, it's, a, it's the effects upon the patient's life. And, and there are a number of factors that can influence the cancer. I mentioned the age of the patient can put you at higher risk. Uh, you're going to have a higher level of oxidative stress, potentially the older you are. Your family history, we just talked about that, nutritional status. Smoking, everyone knows that smoking is a huge, maybe the hugest risk factor of, uh, for cancer. It causes free radicals. I think most people know that and that you're taking a huge risk if you smoke. Uh, carcinogen exposure, we do our best to avoid that. We don't always know we're being exposed. Exercise and fitness, good research to show that if you exercise regularly, you can lower your risk of cancer. Cancer patients do better if they exercise. Radiation, uh, we talked about that as a cause of free radicals. Comorbidity, if you've got another illness on top of your cancer, if you've got congestive heart failure and cancer, or uh, acute or uh, rheumatoid arthritis and cancer, that's going to add more oxidative stress to the equation. Then there's the effects upon the family life, financial stresses of cancer, family system disruption, your belief. You know, a lot of people think they're being punished by God if they've gotten cancer. Uh, or they think, oh, there's no way I can get well. They, they, their belief structure kills them just as bad as the cancer does. I've, I've often said that the word cancer has killed more people than the disease. So be careful about what you believe. Fear and depression. Stage of cancer diagnosis. The more advanced it is, the, 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 the harder it is to, to work, work with. Uh, tumor burden. The size of the tumor makes a difference. The level of pain. That causes oxidative stress. And then, of course, chemotherapy causes major oxidative stress. So all of these factors boil down to oxidative stress. And so hopefully you'll kind of get the, 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 the notion that that oxidative stress is what's throwing things out of balance. Now, how does that relate to cancer? Dr. Stephen Hickey has written a, a wonderful book called Cancer, Nutrition, and Survival. And in it, he has a, a very simple quote, the cellular redox environment. Remember, we want to keep balance in the redox. A simple rule of thumb is that the environment, the microenvironment of healthy cells is reducing rather than oxidizing. What he's saying actually is that a healthy cell is not balanced. There's actually a slight tilt in the direction of antioxidants. If you've got a reducing environment, your cells got a little reserve of antioxidants, which is in line with what Dr. Reardon used to say that health is having the reserve to do what you need to do and want to do with energy and enthusiasm. And so the cells maintain a little, uh, safe, little safety net of, of, of extra antioxidants. Although we depend upon oxidation for metabolism, immune defense, and cell signaling purposes, we must also avoid the damage it can cause. So it's when you lose that balance and start to drift towards higher levels of oxidation that you start getting into uh, damage. Now let's Let's differentiate now between good oxidation and bad oxidation. Well, the good oxidation, if, we, if, if you and I are fighting a virus, like I think I am right now, um, you need your white cells to have what's in, they, they have a little organelle in them called a lysozyme. And inside of that lysozyme, the cell can make peroxide. And that peroxide can help neutralize viruses and bacteria. So hydrogen peroxide is an oxidant. But yet, our white cells makes very good use of it. Thank God we have it. The mitochondria burn calories. Burning is oxidation. When you see a, a, a campfire, that's oxidation. And so the mitochondria is burning the calories that you've just eaten in order to create energy. So we need oxidation in order to create energy. Of course, if that gets out of control, that can cause problems. Now, bad cellular oxidation would be where you have an excess of free radicals, and these tend to set up chain reactions which can damage cell membranes, mitochondria, and DNA, your control mechanisms. Cataracts, macular degeneration, artery disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and cancer are the results of free, unchecked free radicals over time. It's the degenerative theory of uh, illness based upon free radical damage. So. We've talked about oxidative stress. We know that excessive oxidative stress causes persistent, sustained damage. That causes cell signaling, turns on cell signaling. Now, let's add the next step of the equation. That can then change your cell behavior. 
And here's that word that I mentioned just a minute ago, apoptosis. You need to understand apoptosis in order to understand, well, even if you don't do any kind of nutritional therapy and you're just going to go in for radiation or chemotherapy for your cancer, how many of you knew that that's based upon apoptosis? Let's talk a little bit about apoptosis. Normal cell death due to apoptosis. Normally cells with damaged DNA simply die thanks to a process called apoptosis. Now, there was a great illustration of what apoptosis is in terms of the embryo. I'm sure you've seen pictures of embryo where the hands look like little mittens, the fingers have not yet formed. The cells in between the fingers go through a process of apoptosis and they willingly die in order to allow the fingers to be formed. That's apoptosis. It's necessary for normal embryo development. Actually, we have apoptos apoptosis going on even if you don't have cancer. If we didn't have apoptosis, my liver cells would just grow and grow and I'd have a huge liver. But uh, there are control mechanisms. The DNA, the nucleus of the cell, has control mechanisms which kind of keeps track of all this and maintains the normal structures within our body. And so, and if, and if any cell gets old and gets, starts to get damaged, then the oxidation within that cell will start to build up and that oxidation can trigger a special gene that turns on apoptosis. So apoptosis is a very important mechanism. Some, some uh, doctors call it uh, uh, programmed cell death. Programmed cell death. It's, it sounds better than cell suicide. But, but, but basically that's what it is. The cells are willingly dying because they've, they've, they've uh, served their purpose they're damaged beyond repair. Now I'm going to show you this. This is just this looks like a complicated slide, but it just really just shows you how the level of oxidation relates to apoptosis. If you've got a normal cell that has a low oxidative level, a reducing level, a healthy level like we talked about, cell division is inhibited, and this, that cell's not going to die. It's going to be a healthy cell. If you have a mildly damaged cell, maybe some slight inflammation. Now the oxidation level is going to go up. Cells are going to start to divide during, during times of inflammation. Whenever, if you look through nature, whenever there's been some kind of damage, there's a tendency for cells to divide. I really saw that this past spring. We have a tree growing in our backyard. And remember that late uh, freeze that we got and so many of the leaves were damaged? I mean, I think half the leaves fell off that tree. I thought, oh gosh, we're going to have a real crummy tree this year. Well, guess what? There was just a super abundance of more leaves that grew back, probably thicker than I've ever seen on that particular tree. And so the, the inflammation of that damage uh, actually caused the tree to make more leaves. And so, but even at this level, at the cellular level, uh, cell death is inhibited. At, with moderate damage, there is intermediate oxidation, more cell division, and you start to see some apoptosis. Some of the cells that can't handle that level of oxidation will start to program cell death. Now, what about severe damage? High level of oxidation uh, and you have an increase in cell division, but if, it's if the cells are damaged enough, the apoptosis will, will knock them out. Or if the damage is so severe, the mechanism that controls apoptosis will be damaged and then the cell cannot go into apoptosis. It will start to just divide but there's nothing to stop it now because the control mechanisms have been lost due to the oxidative damage. Now down here, irreparable damage, severe free radical damage, cell division stops, the cell just plain dies. And that may not require any uh, mechanisms, but it's not a very efficient way to promote the death of uh, diseased cells. So the, the way the body regulates apoptosis is through a gene called P53. It's regulated actually by many special genes, but especially a lot of attention has been given to the P53 tumor suppressor gene. And the way that this gene suppresses tumors is that once a cell becomes damaged, as long as this gene is working properly, it will cause apoptosis and that cancer cell will die. And that's why they say and I guess Dr. Reardon knew a, a Japanese pathologist who actually did used to, 
on, on the uh, uh, autopsies that he did, he would very carefully dissect all of the organs and he could find cancer in just about everyone. So the idea is, is that we all have cancer in us, but we have control mechanisms that prevents it from getting out of hand. Well, that one of those very important control mechanisms is the P53 tumor suppressor gene. So back to this idea of cell signaling. This actually happens within the cells. Oxidative damage to the membrane of the nucleus can trigger the formation of another cytokine, NF kappa B. This initiates an array of inflammatory responses, but if the uh, intracellular oxidation escalates, that can then damage more of the organelles of the cell, such as the nucleus, uh, but it can also damage the mitochondria. And, and remember, the mitochondria is like a hot furnace. And if it's damaged, it's going to release oxidants in the cell. Matter of fact, that's how they think apoptosis works. The P53 gene signals the mitochondria to just open up, and that's what causes the rapid cell death. Further oxidative damage signals the cell to change behavior in an attempt to survive. We'll see some cells escape the apoptosis mechanism, and then other things start to happen. This is an example of, of the oxidants attacking various levels of the cell. And the, these are bad oxidants. Uh, excessive sunlight, heavy metals, uh, trans fats. So you, reactive oxygen species. They say that each cell is hit by 10,000 free, radical, 10, free radicals a day. So our cells are, are, are ready to deal with a certain level of oxidation. But if you go beyond that, then that's where the cell membrane starts to break down and the free radicals get in and start damaging the mitochondria and the nucleus and then that's where you get your DNA damage and you start to lose the control of genes like the P53. So your apoptosis mechanisms are damaged with DNA damage secondary to escalating oxidative stress. These apoptosis mechanisms themselves are damaged and slowly become inoperative. So oxidative stress signals increased cell division. Cancer cells are generally under oxidative stress, which may be the essential feature of cancer growth. Because, because the cancer cells really are a damaged cell in most cases, they, there is a tendency for them to want to divide. Natural selection favors cancer cells with a high level of oxidants because they divide more rapidly. The higher the level of oxidation, the more the cancer cells want to divide. And the only thing that stops them is, is like the P53 genes. And so this really is an example of how this works. If you increase oxidative stress inside the cell, there's going to be a tendency for cell division to increase. But you reach a certain point of oxidative stress, apoptosis and necrosis takes over. That's the way it should work. This is cancer prevention right here. But unfortunately, if you lose if you lose your DNA that's, that regulates, the, or the P53 DNA, this sets the stage for the perpetual replication of cells with mutated or damaged DNA. This is what we know as cancer. In other words, if the oxidative damage damages the control mechanisms and, and oxidation is stimulating replication of the cells, guess what? They're just going to start replicating. Isn't that what cancer is? It's exactly what happens. Mutated DNA is unable to repair the damaged genes. A lot of times, you know, we don't realize it, but our cells take a beating throughout our lives. Granted, a number of cells are actually replaced, but uh, folic acid is a good example of a nutrient that repairs damaged DNA. Nutrition is for the purpose of growth and repair. And without adequate nutrition, we can't repair some of those, those genes. We don't have the building blocks to do the repair. And if the DNA itself gets more and more damaged, then the mechanisms that would otherwise repair cancer cells, they're damaged. And so then the, the, uh, the likelihood of cancerous cells to redifferentiate back to healthy cells is even less. And so this is the importance of having a good nutritional environment for your cells as well as a good antioxidant environment. So Dr. Hickey, he defines this as the microevolutionary hypothesis, which means that damaged cells divide rapidly. And whenever you're trying to do things in a hurry, aren't errors more likely to occur? This is true with damaged cells. 
And unfortunately, natural selection pressures favors the more primitive cells that are, that are more selfish and more like the ancestral cells that predated our cells that work together as a community. These are what I call the sociopathic cells. These are the, no, really, they're like, they're like a good kid that got in a bad neighborhood and in order to survive, he had to take on the tactics of the gangs in order to survive. And he, he became more primitive in his behavior. Multicellular organisms have complex signaling and control mechanisms that are subject to damage, oxidative stress damage. Damaged cells ten, will tend to revert to single cell survival tactics that involve competition rather than cooperation. Uh, Dr. Hickey's written another article called Cancer as the Selfish Cell. And that's what cancer cells are. They don't care about the rest of the organism. They only care that they get enough blood supply and enough sugar for themselves, enough nutrients for themselves. And so they will kind of like hoard certain nutrients as, as, as far as that goes. So uh, cancer really is where cells that were meant to work together have lost the ability to do that. They've lost their control mechanisms. Now they're acting like single cells and unfortunately it brings about the demise of the host. So it's really not a very good long-term strategy. So malignant transformation creates the non-healing wound. What we actually see, if, if any of you have ever seen advanced cancer, it, it really looks like a wound that's just not going to heal. Uh, most of the time it's on the inside, but if you've ever seen someone with advanced breast cancer or skin cancer, it's a non-healing wound. Mitochondrial function shifts anaerobic. In other words, uh, cancer cells are not interested in oxygen. They'll function without oxygen because they burn pure sugar. Metabolic toxins accumulate and there is malignant transformation of the entire cellular injury site into the non-healing wound of cancer. Now this, uh, this would be a very advanced, kind of like a stage four or advanced form of cancer. But it's actually there in the lower stages, but to where it would look like this would be more advanced. So conventional, this is, now this is gonna be interesting to you. Conventional cancer treatments kill cancer cells by increasing oxidation and inducing apoptosis. Your oncologist and your radiation oncologist, they're actually trying to increase oxidation because they want to induce apoptosis mechanisms. But unfortunately, if, 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 the, if the oxidation is too severe, that will start to damage the P53 gene, thereby allowing therapy-resistant cells to emerge and multiply. In my books, the ideal redox therapy would be both an antioxidant that helps repair the apoptosis control and a pro-oxidant that signals the initiation of apoptosis of damaged cancer cells. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Here at the center, we, we use intravenous vitamin C, uh, somewhat controversially because it's been known that cancer cells, uh, are, I'm sorry, that patients have low vitamin C levels and cancer cells will preferentially take in uh, vitamin C. It turns out that the vitamin C molecule is very similar to glucose. Vitamin C is reported to accumulate in tumors and other tissues. Now what we did, this, was, this study was actually done I think about 12 years ago where we looked at 12 healthy volunteers. We gave them 15,000 milligrams of vitamin C in a vein over about 45 minutes and then we measured their, their vitamin C level after, afterwards, right after the infusion was in. The normal vitamin C level is about one maybe one or two milligrams per deciliter. But after a vitamin C infusion, it jumps way up to about 154, unless you have cancer. If you've got cancer, that post-vitamin C level was only about 54. And the reason for this is oxidative stress. A lot of the vitamin C gets neutralized trying to uh, deal, deal with the oxis, oxidative stress debt, if you will. It's a kind of debt that the vitamin C comes in and pays off, but in the process, the, the plasma level goes way down, lower than what we would expect it to be. So uh, 18 cancer patients were randomly selected. I had Dr. Hyland group these patients by stage. And, and so we, 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 we just, we, they were either local, local, which meant no spread beyond organ boundaries, regional, spread was just in the region of the tumor, such as the lymph nodes, or distant, it had metastasized to other parts of the body. And what we found 
is that once again, here's those 12 healthy normals. No cancer, they have a, a post vitamin C level of about 154. Here's the, the local. The cancer is just localized just to uh, where the tumor is starting to grow. Here's the regional and here's the distance. So what this tells us that as the cancer advances, it creates more oxidative stress. Dr. Xiaolong Ming has done a lot of our research here at the center. He's the one that's currently doing the cytokine studies and he's found that the IV vitamin C can take these cytokines and start to drive them in a more healthy, more no normal direction. Even one 75 gram IVC will cause a dramatic shift in cytokine activity towards normal. And the reason we're investigating this is that we would like to be able to create a subset, not 174 cytokines, which is pretty expensive to measure, but if we can measure 10 or 12, or in this case 22, we, we know that those are like markers as to whether or not the cancer is getting better. So this cytokine index looks like a very good way of helping us to monitor the status of the patient's disease process. And so these are the, this is the slide that I showed you earlier. You can see how this cancer patient's angiogenesis cytokines were elevated, oncogene activation elevated, mitogenesis was elevated. And so these can be reduced by <clears throat> intravenous vitamin C. So remember that damaged cells divide rapidly, errors result, natural selection favors the more primitive cells that strive to survive. Multicellular organisms have complex signaling and control mechanisms that are subject to damage. And it's the damaged cells that revert to the single cell survival tactics rather than uh, cooperation. Okay, I put that in there because this is the summary slide. Cancer is the regression back to the selfish cell. Cancer cells have regressed from multicellular cooperation back to single cell survival t tactics, paradoxically causing the more rapid demise of the host organism. Unless you intervene, unless you intervene. And, and, and what this lecture I hope implies to you is that if you can give yourself adequate antioxidants, if you can, um, if you can feed your cells right and well, they have control mechanisms which will help prevent this. Uh, if you have genetically uh, programmed deficiencies, you can do testing to find out where your nutrient deficiencies are and begin to intervene and make a difference. I'm not going to go into that. Those are the three theories of, of cancer, that, that cancer emerges because of a lack of adequate micronutrients, uh, the functional repair tissue uh, where, where, where it's the non-healing wound because you deplete your nutrients and then the microevolutionary hypothesis where the damaged cells revert back to single cell behavior. So just to summarize, what really causes cancer? It appears to be a maladaptive cellular response to sustained injury. The persistence of the injury depletes the repair molecules and results in chronic oxidative stress overload, which that stress damages the DNA. It's very highly pro-inflammatory and it's accompanied by a lot of out pouring of cytokines. Unfortunately, the excessive inflammatory cytokines change the cell's behavior. The damaged cells would normally respond to oxidative stress with this uh, apoptosis. But unfortunately, the excessive DNA damage and mutation results in the loss of this control of apoptosis. And then you have uncontrolled cellular proliferation. Injured multicellular tissues undergo malignant transformation and regress back to the selfish single cell survival behavior. So, the, so if we were going to take what I've to told you today and, and develop a rational treatment for cancer, first of all, you would want to keep your redox in nice balance. You want to make sure you have a good level of antioxidants. Whenever you can, remove the injuring things from your life. If you are exposed to carcinogens or if you become more aware of carcinogens, try to reduce those. That's going to reduce the number of cellular injuries. Don't, don't, you know, if you smoke, obviously quit smoking. You're, you're giving, you're, you're causing major disruptions there. So anything you can do to reduce injury is good. Now, if you've got cancer, interestingly enough, you treat it with oxidation. You want a pro-oxidant to help you create the apoptosis that's going to cause these cells, the, the damaged cells to just die. 
but uh, you don't want to treat them with too much oxidation. You want to control excessive inflammation and you would like to restore the whole cell. Uh, you want to have whole cell nutrition. Now we think that the Reardon IVC cancer protocol, the IV vitamin C, is. it, it turns out it's a very powerful antioxidant. It does rebalance redox. It's a detoxifier. It helps you get rid of toxic chemicals. It's a heavy metal chelator. It does remove disruptions. At high dosages, this is a whole other lecture that's available, uh, but I'm not going to go into it today, but at high dosages, vitamin C creates hydrogen peroxide. It's a pro-oxidant, so it can actually result in the death of cancer cells. This was, this was verified. Our original research was verified at NIH here about two years ago. And then it helps you control inflammatory cytokines. It's a very good anti-inflammatory treatment. And vitamin C promotes whole, uh, whole cell uh, restoration. This is my last slide. Uh, I threw this in. This is not, on your, not in your packet. I, I thought of this yesterday. Dr. Charles Simone uh, spoke here at one of our conferences. And he wrote a book called The Truth About Breast Health and Breast Cancer. And there's been quite a bit of controversy about do antioxidants interfere with chemotherapy and radiation for cancer. And what he found is that antioxidants enhance the treatment kill rate and reduce treatment side effects. What is, what is evidence does he have? He, he quotes 145 cellular studies, 135 animal studies, 50 human studies, and he looked at 8,500 patients, 5,000 of whom took antioxidants. 4,700 of the 5,000 showed increased survival. So what I'm saying about oxidative stress is very real. And if you can reduce your oxidative stress, that alone will help you with, with your survival. So uh, if you want to know more about this, we have uh, some online lectures where you, if you have high-speed internet, you can go to healthhunteronline.org and watch uh, video lectures on demand about how to, how to use IV vitamin C, how to conquer cancer with uh, redox synergy. Uh, these are some of the topics that are available there. And plus, we have a, a whole slate of lectures that, uh, that, that recur on a, on a rotating basis. And so, whew, at, that point, at this point, I'm going to have Dr. Glenn Hyland come up, and I'd like to take your questions. For those of you in the satellite areas, um, you're welcome to come into the panorama room to ask any questions that you might have. Okay, got it up here. Let's see. For those of you... We're going to get you on, on, uh, on tape. Uh, chronic use of vitamin C in high doses is known to cause kidney damage. With these high, very mega dose of vitamin C and IV use, are you seeing any kidney damage? Or how off long are you using this? Vitamin C is converted to oxalate, and there was the notion that vitamin C did create kidney stones and damage the kidneys. And actually, there's been a number of major studies using, looking at oral vitamin C showing that it really doesn't cause kidney stones, even though that idea was there. Uh, also, if that were true, I always tell people we would be the kidney stone capital of the world. Because uh, over the course of the year, 20 years that I've been here, I estimate we've given over 30,000 intravenous vitamin C infusions. And I can remember maybe one person, maybe two, that had a kidney stone. Uh, and vitamin C, uh, if you have a tendency for kidney stones, vitamin C is not the best treatment for it. We use magnesium and B6. But, uh, but we've not found vitamin C to damage the kidneys. Now, if you've got renal failure, that's a contraindication to IV vitamin C. And some of the cases where damage occurred, it was given inappropriately. And we've got a protocol that precautions against uh, using it that way. Yes, right here. OK. Go ahead. Uh, two questions. Uh, just, I don't know what the kine is in cytokine. I know cyro stands for cell, but what does kine stand for? Action. Kinetic. Pardon? Action. Action? Uh-huh. Kinetic. Okay. I wrote a question down here, and I don't know if it's, if it's an even intelligent question. Uh, how does inflammation cause oxidation? Well, inflammation creates, brings white blood cells to the area that's been damaged. And the white blood cells contain these lysozymes, 
which contain peroxide. So inflammation can create more, more oxidative stress at the area of, of damage. It can also br bring about a healing too, so it can both work both ways. Um, do you think taking oxygen can help um, kill cancer cells? Dr. Well, uh, it, it's in getting the oxygen to the cancer cell, yes. Uh, it's a deficiency of oxygen. It's called the Warburg effect is probably one of the things that allows for <coughs> injury to happen to the cell that will eventually lead to a cancer formation. So getting the oxygen there, but the thing is, is how do you do that? Uh, just taking oxygen through a nasal cannula probably doesn't get enough oxygen to the cancer tissue to make a difference. A hyperbaric oxygen may help in that regard. So uh, it's finding a way. Exercise, that's one reason why exercise is important, is that it increases the blood flow and therefore supposedly the oxygen level to the cancer area. So yes, I think it does help. Okay, great. What about hydrogen peroxide infusion? What about hydrogen peroxide infusion? There are uh, places around the country that are using hydrogen peroxide infusion. I think the concern that we discovered here, we've, we've tried it. Uh, it it's, can be very sclerosing to the veins. Uh, the beauty of vitamin C over hydrogen peroxide is that the biological protective effects of vitamin C are, are, are great. Uh, a lot of cancer patients are, in my mind, a lot of them are suffering from scurvy. Uh, they have very low vitamin C levels, they're tired, they have low appetite, they're depressed, uh, they have no motivation. And when we give the IV vitamin C, we're actually correcting the, the, uh, the, either the full-blown scurvy or the subclinical scurvy that they have. They're not eating very well. And so, so the vitamin C helps biologically as well as having the selective kill of uh, tumor cells. By, by the, and, and the beauty of the vitamin C is that it, it doesn't convert to peroxide until it gets into the tissues. Uh, or either that or there are mechanisms in the blood that prevent the development of significant amounts of peroxide. So, so it's, it's able to act in the, the, the way that the NIH study put it. It's like a prodrug because we're using vitamin C at pharmacologic doses to deliver it to the tissues and there it converts the peroxide which the peroxide then creates the apoptosis of the cancer cells. So it's a little more subtle. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's also it safer. It's much safer, works both ways, whereas pro the IV peroxide, the only thing it's going to do is uh, kill the tumor cell, which that's good, but, uh, but vitamin C, you get both actions working. Yeah, in the normal cell, you'll have a higher oxygenated state, and therefore antioxidants like vitamin C will act as an antioxidant in the normal tissue. In the cancer tissue, it has a lower oxygenation, therefore it uh, helps the vitamin C to produce the hydrogen peroxide, which is the killing molecule normally used by the body uh, for cancer cells, bacteria, virus, fungi, so forth. What do you know about the acid-alkaline balance in the body and, and the development of cancer? Oxidation is almost always accompanied by acidosis. Oxidation and acidosis kind of go hand in hand. And so if someone has severe oxidative stress, very often they are going to be in an acidotic state. And so there are some therapies geared towards trying to move the body back to more uh, uh, alkalosis. But what foods create alkalosis? Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. And so you're going to get your antioxidants, you're going to get your alkalosis, you're going to get all the other nutrients that you need to kind of help the body balance this out and restore the, the, the health of the cell. The preceding program was presented by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International in the Bright Spot for Health Lunch and Lecture Series. To inquire about additional health-related information available on DVD, audio CD, VHS, or audio cassette, simply call 316-682-3100 or drop by 3100 North Hillside in Wichita, Kansas. To discover more about the center and what we have to offer, be sure and visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.